This is Daybreak, and thank you for staying with us here on the broadcast. Uh, we are discussing the life sentence, the death penalty, life sentence under the judgments issued by the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal in regards to the two topics at hand, at hand here on the broadcast. And we are taking the account of Steve Ogola, who is an advocate of uh, the High Court, Wesley Waku, who is a legal officer with the Justice Defenders, and Demas Kiprono, who is a campaign manager at Amnesty International, and the account we are well welcome your contributions here on the broadcast and we'll sample them towards the tail end of this broadcast. I come to you again, Steve, and uh, I earlier on mentioned uh, the judgment by Judge Jesse Lassid. This was in regards to the Willie Kimani murder, uh, which happened in 2016. His client and uh, he, the taxi driver who were also involved under uh, the ruling by the court brought one in a six year search for justice at uh, the High Court and uh, the Frederick Lelliman, and, and this is just a breakdown of the sentencing, was sentenced to, to uh, accused of murder and uh, it, it brought to an end uh, the six year search for justice and uh, following witnesses who were lined up by the uh, prosecution and uh, at the end there were different sentences uh, to the different officers who were involved. I mean to just understand the application there of the timing of course is very important after or before the Muruwatetu matter that the Supreme Court had cited. I mean, for, for example, if we are, if you are to read that judgment, what do you then deduce as uh, to the different sentencing that apply to the different officials who are involved in the murder case of the lawyer, his client and the taxi driver? What Justice La Lesid said, he looked at the facts presented, the evidence before her, in respect of the charges against each and accused person. And I said, what was proved based on the degree of participation and their involvement in that, in that of in the commission of that offense? They said, you know what? I will give a graduated sentence, again guided by the judgment in Muruwatetu, yeah. based on your level of culpability in that case. So, and these are, there are some of the beneficiaries of Muruwatetu because Ideally, if you are charged with murder, regardless of the circumstances under which you are charged, once convicted of that offense, which means you're found guilty, then the degree of commission of that, the heinous nature of that offense would then become irrelevant. But now under the new principle, under the guideline judgment in Muratetu, yeah. it gives the court some wiggle room. And that is not to say that our courts are not keen on punishing offenders. Although the right framing, as Dimas has said, the transition from in the criminal justice system from, rehab, from retribution to rehabilitation yeah. is still meant that the process of rehabilitation is still confinement. And while you're there, you have time to reflect and to be given opportunity to involve yourself in activities that can change your behavior. And so that when you're reintegrated back to the society, you become a better person. We're still very keen mm -hmm. on punishing offenders. I'm using that word liberally because the constitutionally ordained phraseology is rehabilitation. Yeah. But if I were to use that word liberally, uh, the society and our, we have a very int a genuine interest mm -hmm. in making sure that people who commit offenses are held accountable for their actions. But we are also very keen yes. to allow people who committed offenses in a less heinous manner to have a second chance at rehabilitation. So what Jess Lesit did is not any different from what has been applied continuously. I think you were you are, you are mentioning that must have been uh, Justice Aburilia yeah? yes. in the High Court in Siaya, where a lady was, was found guilty of murder, but I think she was sentenced to six months, under one year, if I recall well, because of the circumstances under which she, she killed her husband. This was in a very abusive marriage. And the man had routinely abused her. And on that particular day, although when you're found guilty of murder, it means that the action and the intention are clearly established. You, you are killing someone in circumstances where you know you could have acted differently. But the court is sympathetic to you based on some, the historical context. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, or maybe the, the, circums the peculiar circumstances under which that offense happened. You can say, okay, fine. This is someone who has been proven to have, without lawful justification, killed another person. But look at the circumstances, which do not amount to a defense, because 
if they were defense, she would not have been found guilty of murder. But look at the circumstances. I tend to sympathize with her, and then I tend, I can then use my discretion. So the shift, the shift is in the use of discretion, mm -hmm. and the shift is in the, the use of death sentence as a maximum sentence as opposed to mandatory. Are they good things? I think yes, because that is part of the reform in the criminal justice system. If you look at the broader conversation, I think Kenyans need to know this. The judicial system mm -hmm. <clears throat> is a very small component in the criminal justice system. Because the, the if you look at the conveyor belt, all the actors in the CJS system, the community actually plays not a peripheral, but actually the primary role okay. in making sure that there are less people getting into the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. you know, through family conversation, mentorship, and so on and so yeah. forth. Then you have the police officers who actually investigate these offenses and have a chance to divert them. You know, I, I don't, they are not allowed to divert serious offenses like murder. Okay. Those ones must be taken to court. Yeah? Then you have the prosecutor, the, the DPP, who also has a chance to make a decision to charge. The DPP sometimes diverts these cases, yeah? And then you have the court itself. Then you have the prisons that does the rehabilitation. Then you have the aftercare, the aftercare services, yes. probation mm -hmm. and aftercare yeah. that does the reintegration back into the society. Yeah. I think everybody tends to play their role, but the question of um, benefiting from the new ideology mm -hmm. of looking at sentences as maximum and not mandatory is a huge relief for people, for literally for people who sometimes commit offenses and regret, genuinely regret after, then they are given another chance to. Okay to rehabilitate themselves. Okay, Steve, uh, because you have mentioned uh, very important components in that chain of uh, the CJS. Yes, yes. Uh, because the courts only handle what's presented before them. And, and of course, uh, with regard to the threshold of the evidence presented before the courts of law, they can't just uh, get the cases from the community. And you have mentioned the community, which is uh, the, the very foundation of the entire society. And uh, recent report, and, and that was, uh, as carried out by Oxford University. It said Kenya's death row is populated by those who are poorly educated and were in low level precarious jobs with little financial security. Many had considerable responsibility for welfare of dependents at the time of the offense that they had committed. Then what's the responsibility and who bears that responsibility of creating awareness for an understanding of how our system, our justice system works, what uh, the do's and the don'ts to minimize these cases that often come to the criminal justice system and for many to have an understanding as to the areas which are no-go zone for them not to be punished by the courts of law depending on the cases? I think the responsibility still falls on the state because the state has the political mandate to ensure that some of these social circumstances that trigger uh, people to commit offenses can actually be avoided, for instance, by empowering the youth, for instance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, when they say an adult mind is the, the, the devil's workshop, if the youth, like now, during this protest, yeah, it's so unfortunate, are you? But today you might be reporting casualties arising from this protest. As a lawyer, I will watch from my house in Kileleshwa, watch the TV, assessing, the, evaluating the scenario. Then I'll get into my car, then I'll go to my office, then I'll work. But as an unemployed, an unemployed youth in Kibera, there is an opportunity, I have a collateral interest in those mandamanos. <laughs> and the collateral interest yeah. can be criminal mm -hmm. in the sense that, well, I don't have food. I don't have dinner. So does it even matter that there's mandamano or not? So it presents an opportunity. So it presents an opportunity, I'm, I'm, I'll try my luck. You know, you, <laughs> you allocate risks. You, you're faced this, you don't have food. This mandamano, you, you, will, you will rob the shop, which is an offense. When you, when, you, when you break into a shop and carry away food stuff, of course it's an offense. But look at the circumstances. So some of these social, socioeconomic conditions, if they're addressed, and I understand that research, because the poor masses are more vulnerable than the people who have gone to school and have jobs. Mm -hmm. So those social conditions, if they are addressed by the administration in power, you will reduce the chances of getting criminals, uh, your youth getting into criminal activities. Again, at the family level, it's a shared responsibility. The state carries the heavy burden, yeah. but there's some residual responsibility on the family to mentor the families and communities, to mentor our young people, uh, and to ensure that, because you know they say, as a child is raised, so they become. 
if you are raised, if, you are, if the family plays the role, the rightful role, yeah? Yeah. and the youth are mentored well, mm -hmm. they're unlikely to fall into crime. They're unlikely to fall into crime. And I think Tanzania is reputed. I would like to see the statistics yeah? Yeah. in Tanzania. I wish I had time to check. Tanzania generally, within the East African countries, is reputed for discipline and courtesy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have such reputation here in Kenya, it could have collateral benefits. You would have less people committing offenses and less people getting into the criminal justice system. Okay. Uh, Demias, this also by the uh, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights and uh, on the death penalty, which they said is contrary to human rights and the right to life, which they said is fundamental as enshrined in Katiba 2010. It said that revenge is not justice and revenge in form of death penalty only perpetuates violence and suffering and weakness of uh, the very concept of our justice system. It's irreversible torture, discriminatory, and it's incompatible with uh, rehabilitation. This largely points to reintegration. And therefore, how then do we establish, because you can't police the human brain, that someone has reformed or uh, would not commit the crimes that she or he did before getting back or reintegrating into the society as, as much as we preserve the sanctity of the human life that the Constitution of Kenya 2010 advocates for? Yes. Um, you know, actually, this, uh, these services exist, but it's just that we are not using them as much as we could or we are not strengthen, strengthening them. And uh, just to give an example is that if you look at the prison reforms that happened uh, when Moody Awori was Minister of, uh, uh, of Home Affairs, uh, you realize that it is possible for us to really move the needle in terms of uh, expanding justice for all. Um, we have the services, for example, psychological services. We have people who are professionals who can assess uh, inmates and actually establish that this person, uh, through their behavior, through our conversations, has changed. And then, for example, if you look at uh, the case that uh, has caused the whole review, the, this uh, Justice Keogh uh, case, you realize that this person was in his 20s, mm -hmm. uh, was sentenced to life. Uh, the court reviewed it and sentenced him to 40 years. After 40 years, how old will he be? 60. At that 60, will he still likely be a danger to society? Those are the things to consider. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, we understand that inequality breeds uh, certain un unwanted behaviors in society. And uh, for example, in Kenya, if you look at uh, another report by the National Council on Administration of Justice. Yeah. So this report was commissioned in 2015 and probably released around 2019. And they established that over 70% of people within the criminal justice system mm -hmm. are number one, poor, number two, young, uh, and also means that they do not have legal representation. And number three is that they, they, they they encounter the criminal justice system many times. And then they tied this to petty offenses. Mm -hmm. So as a country, we have stuck to the colonial uh, legal mechanism where basically we were trying to exclude people who do not have money or people who do not look like us from general society. And so we had crimes, we made it a crime to be somewhere without an ID, mm -hmm. a, a crime to be somewhere mm -hmm. um, not doing anything, to be idle. We admitted a crime to be somewhere if you don't have money. Most of these things are still in our laws. And this, this, uh, these offenses can be utilized to actually criminalize whole, to criminalize whole societies. Okay. And if you travel to Kilimani, for example, and go to the other estates in Nairobi, depending on economic uh, standing of that estate, you realize that in the poorer areas, police usually round up people, uh, extort them, because, and you know, in these situations, they can even say that, Uta Julia Mbele, you'll know why I'm, yeah. uh, and they can always say that you are dance, d drunk and disorderly and all these other petty offenses. And so by the time a person reaches a certain age, they are f familiar with the police officers in that area they, because of that interaction with the criminal justice system. And so we need to reclassify and uh, remove most of the petty offenses that we have in our in our laws because they actually breed the criminaliz criminalization of certain segments of society. 
we also need to have a way of dealing with uh, of, of the inequalities in society, but more so, we need to have serious community policing. As uh, as uh, council said earlier, yeah. is that societies, communities play a very big role in terms of nurturing peace and security and development within an area. Our our research has found that when the police know the community, when they engage in conversations with the community, they tend to be able to safeguard it without using uh, violent means. Mm -hmm. Even if we go into the issue of Mandamano, in last week CIA had Mandamano and the Mandamano there was peaceful. They, they, <clears throat> they went about their business for an hour and everyone went home. And I would like, I'd bet that that officer the officer commanding that area was very familiar with the organizers and they entered into a dialogue and they agreed basically this is our this is our community express yourselves as the constitution agrees with you and then after that you will go home but what what is the inverse of that okay the inverse of that is where uh, uh, people do not feel part of the community so they do not feel like they own they own anything in that community mm -hmm. what happens they are willing to destroy what are, when they're willing to destroy, the police are willing to engage them, sometimes in, in fatal, uh, using fatal force, okay. which is really discouraged. But when that happens, or even if they're released and you are basically um, um, robbing, an, uh, robbing a premises or, or looting a place with weapons, then you're very likely going to be charged with robbery and violence. Okay. Then you go back to life imprisonment or death sentence. Okay, yeah. and, and you have mentioned uh, the need for yeah. a police that offers service and, and, yeah. and, and the colonial mentality which still, which still seems to dot um, yeah. the policing system in Kenya. And also on the flip end, you have cited the socioeconomic question because uh, if we have an empowered generation who have enough disposable income in their pockets, I'm sure there will be no need of uh, breaking into a shop or a supermarket during protests or even um, go out on the street to demonstrate because you look at uh, the average age of these young people who are demonstrating and they clearly have uh, uh, no jobs or no future and, and they clearly tell you that they have nothing to lose. What's really coming to you then? The, the, the very idea of us giving ourselves this uh, constitution is to have a safer society where there is respect for the rule of law, the sanctity of human lives, uh, human life, and, and the judgments issued by the top court in the country and the appellate court. Again, we have to have a safer society. Then how do we address the puzzle here of uh, the socio-economic aspect? Um, employment, a proper education, good infrastructure, services by the government, which is the responsibility of the state, and which will largely then have an effect of ending the brute force that the police always employ when it comes to these opposite ends. If there's no employment, if there are no jobs, if the young people are not empowered, which automatically then means there'll be brute force to control these young people when they engage themselves, for example, in demonstrations. I mean, how do you address these two puzzles to have a safer society? Uh, I think if you look at our criminal justice system, many of the cases emanate at the instance from the police station because there has to be a complainant who reports at the court. This complainant then registers that complaint on an OB book. Then the police overtakes over the case through investigations. I think in the conduct of the court, the, the police officers conducting the investigations, I think it's important for them to look at those socioeconomic questions that we're talking about here today as to whether the perpetrators of this offense are coming from a perspective of an economic disadvantage. And I think once we look at it from that down perspective mm -hmm. of what causes them to do these wrongs, I think we'll be moving towards a more way of understanding why these crimes are being committed in our society. And it's good to create that balance between having a safe society and at the same time in having this safe society what are we doing to these offenders that are causing this uncertainty or these offenses within society so it's important for as a criminal system for us to balance those two sides and if at that instance we find that an accused person has committed an offense because of basically criminalizing the poverty mm -hmm. i think we will not be solving the problem rather than creating more problem because in the end, we'll end up finding more of them ending up in our connection of facilities. I you prefer to add, you know, there are things at this hour, at my age, I grew up with this fight against Changa. 
that has been going on. Every time there's a crackdown, I'm seeing chiefs being whipped by by their bosses to yeah. deal with chaga in areas. Yet the same society, we have people who are actually educated through chaga money. And we see that um, in other societies, this thing has been decriminalized. There, it is a, I mean, it is a, it is a way of of making money. People are not really dying from changa; they are dying from other uh, chemical substances. And, and what's driving them towards the drinking of uh, the changa, or driving them towards the dance? Again, again we isn't go, it the very social ills in the society that you have exactly. mentioned? The stratification yeah. of the society and along the, economic lines. And then the people who talk down upon them are the people who were involved in things like NYS scandal. Mm -hmm. The money that was supposed to go to the youth is then taken away, and then we want to criminalize the youth for acting disenfranchised mm -hmm. yeah oh, well, well that is policy we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that yeah. and, and steve because we have talked about the death penalty here and no execution enforced ever since 1987 but again isn't it an irony that as a country we have not amended our statutes to be compliant with the of course this, this practice generally and, and what's the role of parliament and at what point should they look at uh, possible amendments to the law well, I think uh, that, that conversation has now been settled um, by the Supreme Court. So we don't need to amend the law uh, at the moment because the reading of the law as it is, is that death penalty is mandatory, is, is, a, is, is, is a maximum, not a mandatory sentence. But if Kenyans wanted to abolish death penalty, then of course they would attempt. I think I, I, I suspect the reason why the Supreme Court fell short of declaring even the, the, the death penalty itself as unconstitutional is because it took cognizance of the reality, the lived reality. I think the conversation in our society has not matured to the level where now we can consider abolishing the death penalty in our laws. Um, at some point, we'll get there. Yeah. At some point, we'll get there. So the, 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 the more pressing question is this. What are we doing in readiness of abolition of the death penalty. I suspect strongly looking at the trajectory of the development of our jurisprudence, our jurisprudence or the jurisprudential trajectory, if you like, in a couple of years, since a gradual win, the death penalty was, was there, was, there was no exception. There, there was no exception to that rule. Once you are found guilty of murder, you are convicted mm -hmm. and sentenced to death penalty. Now we've moved to a place where you have, the courts can have a chance to apply their discretion by evaluating and then telling you, okay, fine, I can apply it as a maximum, but not mandatory. I think in the future, we will reach a place where we have to probably decriminalize some of these offenses and also make the death penalty itself probably totally abolished in our laws. Before we get there, yeah. because it could have the unintended ripple effect of increasing crime rate. Yeah. Because the fact that you run the risk of being sentenced to being, being jailed, uh, being, being, being committed to a, a, to a death sentence can itself, work, can itself work as a deterrence for people who want to commit such offenses. So I think before we amend the laws, yeah. we have to ask ourselves as a, as a society, are we ready for that conversation? I think from the statistics I see, the, 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 the pressing problem comes from Meru County. Mm -hmm. For a long time, and even up to now, the High Court in Meru is reporting a lot of conviction rate on persons convicted of, of murder. So now, it, it, now you can talk about a perception problem in Meru County, for instance, yeah? Uh, so then what is the conversation there? How can we reverse that? And if you happen to reverse that, how can we then use that as a template mm -hmm. in other counties? So that generally we have people who are not thinking about, because you know, at, the, at the end of the day, are you, as a rational thinker, I must understand that consequences will follow my actions. Yeah. And it's not enough to say, let's provide job, job opportunities, we must, because dealing with socioeconomic circumstances make, make our youth less vulnerable and therefore busy and engaged and therefore committing offenses become less attractive. But with or without jobs, because there are people like ourselves, I mean, we grew up in those circumstances, we never got into criminal offenses. Mm -hmm. So this, a youth, as, a, as a youth, someone must take responsibility for, the, for their actions and decisions, and they must know that their actions have consequences. Once we build that resilience from, from below, this will be the real case of bottom up. Bottom up. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> because then you are building conversation from below and not you and then using this conversation okay. to strengthen the criminal justice system the criminal justice system is a crucial but a very fragile system it can collapse on the weight of disobedience there will be no justice see the justice system presupposes that a large number of the population are generally compliant with the laws if, if they are not compliant, and what makes people compliant, partly is the sanctions, mm -hmm. and partly is the conversation, largely is the conversation around what is good and what is wrong, what is right and wrong, the right and wrong conversation. So let's build a conversation that takes discourages commission of offenses, mm -hmm. and discourages commission of particularly heinous offenses like what we are discussing now. Then we will realize that the rates have gone down. So I think we would track. Yeah. If the judiciary could give us statistics, yeah, every quarter, how many persons have been charged with the offense of murder? Now we are done with processing them. Mm -hmm. Processing them, I'm happy with the way those cases have been processed, yeah, especially murder cases. But at the entry level, do we have statistics of how many how many Kenyans, or how many people within this territory are being charged with the offense of murder? Mm -hmm. is, is there a pattern of reduction? or if the trend is upward. If the trend is upward, the solution is not the law. The solution lies elsewhere. And I think we need to look that elsewhere and find a way of managing our social ills, addressing some of them through conversations, through mentorship, and through self-reflection. Okay. And w when you talk about, Steve, uh, obedience and, and the, uh, the presupposing of the same by the uh, criminal justice system, there has been clearly a willy-nilly disobedience of court orders, and especially by, by the ruling elite in this country. And if there is any rattling that's caused by the independent institutions and the laws as a result of Katiba 2010, then it's the constitution that stands to be defended. Isn't it also concerning, therefore, that, for example, if you look at uh, the Jubilee government, President Kenyatta's government, the blatant disregard for court orders. I mean, what does this then communicate? What, sig what signal does it send to those at the bottom of the pyramid who are socio-economically disadvantaged? I mean... Well, it just signals the breakdown in the rule of law. Uh, as I've said, also the rule of law itself, crucial but fragile, very crucial but fragile ideal. It presupposes that we'll recognize the hierarchy of our, law, of our, of our court system and the finality of judicial pronouncements. When Judicial pronouncements are not taken seriously by the political administration or the political elite. Mm -hmm. They send a bad signal to the poor masses so that there are no consequences. So uh, there's only so much the courts can do. The courts have a limited role of pronouncing themselves on the law, applying the law to a particular set of factual issues that have been proven before them, be it constitutional questions, be it criminal questions. Mm -hmm. If someone is charged with an offense, if you prove it, the required threshold, beyond reasonable doubt, the court will apply the law to that. Yeah. Whether that law is now enforced, or that sentence now enforced, is a separate and distinct question that has nothing to do with the courts. Mm -hmm. I like what Gidu Mugai said when he was the Attorney General. He said, um, he was asked, how come you are the Attorney General and government doesn't seem to be doing things the right way? I said, you know what, as the Attorney General, mine is to prefer legal advice. But as to whether that legal advice is applied or not yeah. is a separate question that is beyond me. So I think, yes, we would make an appeal that it was the political elite, actually the ruling, the, the administration of the day, yeah, need to understand that the ability to govern lies entirely on the ability to comply with the law. Mm -hmm. Because when they're not complying with court judgments, I think Uru's administration ignored many mm -hmm. court judgments. The implication of that is there are no consequences. There are no consequences, and therefore, the leaders who are supposed to know better are not bound by the law, they're not bound by judicial pronouncement. Why should I, as a poor person, living in the, on, on the, at, at, the, the, at the margins of life, li literally on the margin, yeah? Yeah. without food, without basic amenities, why should I be bound by the law? Mm -hmm. It would have the ripple effect of yeah. increasing yeah. Criminal, uh, uh, criminal cases. Yeah. And, and without the consequences, of course, and before I come to us, still uh, on you, Steve, and the, the avalanche of court cases that uh, the Kenyatta administration had disobeyed, and, and clearly this government is also made up by 
officials who at some point even call for the wholesale suspension of the constitution and mm. calling upon the former president when they were in the Jubilee government to rule with iron fist, call judges' names, including the Supreme Court judges, when it had undetermined the presidential election petition of 2017. And even ranking cabinet members right now in the Kenya Kwanzaa administration who have called out names of judges days before the polls in 2017. I mean, it, it seems to be a continuous pro process and a perpetual continuity of players within the establishment who seem to be having no regard for the constitution and the provisions mm -hmm. contained therein. I mean, th does it not project a negative image of Kenya being a state built on unrun, ungoverned? by the principles of good governance and constitutionality. I agree entirely. There's, there's, I hope there's a disturbing pattern of political arrogance in this country. And I can't just wrap my head around it. For instance, what Senator Cherelge said, I mean, if there are things, if you know you're a lawyer, you should not utter. Because then it makes people question, not just your seriousness, but also your training as a lawyer. You cannot utter statements like, we can suspend the constitution for seven hours, we deal with these people. That kind of arrogance, we can only imagine, but we should not be able to hear it coming from a political leader. Because then it just shows there's no country here. There's really no country. And this is what we saw in Uhuru's administration. Dwale, then majority leader, routinely antagonized Justice Odunga, completely and unfairly. Say, so, you know, even profiled him as, you know, as a Rail Odinga judge. I know this is someone who's trying to apply his mind to factual issues. They discouraged and demoralized judicial officers. He, he, they refused to appoint judges. The ones that were sworn in after President Ruto took office. I mean, you look at what is happening in this country in terms of our rule of law index, and you wonder where we're heading as a country. And I can tell you, there's a, a direct correlation. Okay. If you look at uh, World Bank report on ease of doing business in this country, one of the indicators there other than political stability, is the rule of law. And they observe and they advise our development partners and people who want to come and invest in this country. There is no certainty. What is the law can change abruptly. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like shooting yourself in the foot because you <clears throat> want the country to grow, you want the economy to grow, and you want the country to develop, but you don't understand that complying with court orders is a critical, more or less an inextricable ingredient All right. in that you are in, 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 in your grand plan. So I would just urge, I would judge compliance. Government must not compete with citizens in disobeying or disregarding the law. Government must not break the law. Mm -hmm. You know, we have not, if you look at the legal system, it does not contemplate that government or public office will break the law because then who will enforce it? Who will enforce it? You can't compete with private citizens in breaking the law, like even the mandamanos that are happening today. Yes, there's been a lot of violence and a lot of illegalities clothed in under Article 37, freedom of association. You can pick it, you can demonstrate. But if you look at the demonstration, they take a criminal, there's, it's, to be honest, there's a bit of it that carries some flavor of criminality. Mm -hmm. But the response, the right response, the right response is to graduate and make sure that you do everything possible to avoid people from committing offenses and not use that instance to also create, your, and also to commit to violate the law as the person who is supposed to be implementing and protecting the law. Mm -hmm. If they don't follow the law, okay. there'll be a terrible breakdown and then there'll be no country to govern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wesley, coming to you. I'm looking at the report by the Death Penalty Project, and uh, they said uh, we require about 87 million Kenya shillings a year to maintain uh, prisoners who are serving uh, a sentence, who have been sentenced to death. And how does this speak to the, the, the reason for decongestion of prisons, going by the judgments made by the Supreme Court and the Appellate Court. And, and you, of course, uh, um, and your opinion as a legal officer with the justice defenders. I think as, as the question of the congestion of our prison has more or less been taken from a different perspective from what I expected, because you find that whenever there has been announcement by the CS for Interior that there are plans to decongest various prisons, you find that the main focus is on those petty offenders, those who have been convicted for less than a year, six months. And uh, 
those who are serving death row or various long sentences mm -hmm. never get to benefit from this program of uh, early releases or decongestion of prison. So you find that we are running in circles. We uh, release uh, petty offenders who statistically end up in re-offending, going back and clogging the system, okay. and forgetting these ones who have stayed in the system for a longer period, who in turn is causing the government the major expenses in feeding them, providing them, and containing them within those safe uh, containment measures within our correctional facilities. And I think it's upon us now to relook on how we decongest our prisons, rather not focusing on the petty offenders, because even if you look at how the institution of the prison is established, the many rehabilitative programs within prisons are not meant for those who are serving short sentences. Mm -hmm. They are meant for those who are doing long sentences. So statistically speaking, if you convict someone for six months, ideally they are unlikely to complete any rehabilitative program within any correctional facility within this country. So the risk of them reoffending again becomes higher. And that is why we have these many cases of rebidism within our criminal system. I think the approach should now come towards looking at these people who are serving very long sentences, towards giving them a, a chance of being released and decongesting the <coughs> prison, because majority of the congested prisons are actually the maximum prisons. If you look at Kamiti, Naivasha, and many others, you find that the ones that suffer greatly from the uh, congestion problem. But you find that they rarely benefit from the decongestion problem that the government periodically initiates. Mm -hmm. So I think as a society, we need to relook really on how we decongest our prisons. And by that, we'll be able to less elevate the burden of government providing for these people who are on death row or those who are serving very long sentences within our collection of facilities. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Demas, because there are also concerns about the miscarriage of justice, mm -hmm. then at what point then do we incorporate, for example, the use of technology? And it clearly, there are many who are serving life sentence in prison for crimes they never committed, but being at the wrong place, mm -hmm at the wrong time, and the understanding is that uh, the courts only admit evidence, and depending on the threshold, they, ruled, they rule on, the, on those matters and, and dispense with those matters. Uh, and then how important is it that we incorporate technology, including uh, proper DNA samples to be taken to avoid miscarriage of justice and innocent people serving life sentences? Well, uh, indeed, um, because of technology, uh, we have noticed or we have realized that uh, the criminal justice system is not a perfect system, it is flawed. Um, the societies that were happy to put people on the death, on the death penalty or on the chair, on the electric chair, uh, because of DNA evidence, were able to just retrieve, the, if it was something to do with uh, physical evidence like blood or semen or other things, discovered that this person is not the person who did the deed. And so it's, it is incumbent upon the criminal justice system to ensure that every person who is convicted, indeed, uh, to the best extent possible humanly, uh, are the correct person who did it. Uh, but that is not really possible. Uh, even with technology, there are certain flaws in, in terms of DNA evidence, there are certain flaws in terms of even uh, uh, things like uh, software used for uh, to identify faces, facial recognition uh, systems. And so th that is the reason why even the people we, f we condemn, that we need to be mindful of their rights. We need to ensure that they are, wherever they are, they, all their human dignity and human rights are, are intact. And that is why uh, prison systems should be, should be reformed in terms of uh, how they concentrate on or the well-being of the, the, the human person in there. The Mandela rules from 2015 mm -hmm. and emphasize that, yes, indeed, there are people who may need to be taken away from society for the purpose of public safety. Mm -hmm. But even when they are away for this purpose, we need to keep them their, their, like their humanity intact mm -hmm. through education, through training programs, um, through uh, psychological well-being, so that even if they come out, they are whole people. It should not be prison, prisons are where we deposit people that the society has uh, given up on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the earlier question on public opinion, uh, the reason we have not really 
removed the death penalty is because there is a large uh, proportion of parliamentarians who actually are pro-death penalty. So we have not reached that critical mass where we, we, we can trust MPs to pass an, uh, an amendment to the laws that removes the death penalty. Mm. Uh, that does not take away the human rights aspects yeah. and the, the cruel nature of it. Uh, does not take away the arguments that we put forward that it is actually dignity, it is actually a form of torture in itself. Mm -hmm. And governments which are uh, bound to protect, promote and fulfill human rights must not act like criminals themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we argue that all these things should be removed. Uh, and that includes the yeah. obeying of uh, yeah. uh, the rules, and, and, yeah. and, and in this case, the application of the same to all Kenyans with no regard for um, I the positions that uh, they hold or uh, the application of the law, which should be equal and uh, should be the common factor that uh, binds the country together because that informs also political stability. And Steve, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the numbers of um, of death sentences since 2005 and the trajectory seems to have grown between 2001 and 2005 largely from 728 to 744 this is from the kenya prisons as uh, service and the situation of the death penalty in kenya and ideally it's uh, about uh, the restorative justice and, and, and the retributive theory of punishment. And the, the research has concluded, and to just uh, cite this as part of uh, the, the one done by uh, Oxford University, and it, it, it clearly showed that while there is a focus on uh, the restorative justice, it has shown that death penalty may not effectively deter crime, and in some cases, people have been executed for murder even though they were not guilty, and we, talk about, we talked about the miscarriage of justice. But then again, how will the, for example, in the case of uh, CI County that you have mentioned, of uh, the family, the woman who killed her husband and then sentenced to six months in jail, I mean, well, I mean how will the other party feel when, when she is released back to the society? Yet we are talking about restorative justice. What about the relations and the family members of the husband who was killed, for example, despite the court looking into the abusive nature of the marriage she had with her husband and the violence meted on her? How will the other end feel? No, they should feel that justice has been served because judicial officers have the requisite technical skills to evaluate the nature of that offense and to allocate the right punishment. So I'm not, I'm not a great fan of people questioning for the sake of it judicial discretion mm -hmm. or maybe whatever expertise someone may have because there's a presumption of regularity and there's a presumption of competence in their performance of those duties but there will always be instances where somebody has fallen through the cracks and someone who ought not to have been sentenced to death has been sentenced to death. That's why we have the appellate process. Uh, they should appeal. As many people are, 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 as are aggrieved with uh, the death sentence made against them should appeal the higher courts, the court of appeal. And occasionally it might make itself the Supreme Court if there's an, an exceptional question or anger to it. I like the, the, the report from Kenya Prisons. Actually, Kenya Prison is the unsung hero. They're doing an amazing job. Uh, one of the things we share with my co-panelist, Dimas, here, when I was at ICJ, which is a premier human rights institution, was at Article 19. And I know justice defenders. And when I was at ICJ, working as a human rights lawyer, we worked very closely with Kenya Prison. Now, I still, I still, I still maintain very close contact with, with KPS, Kenya Prison Service. They're doing a great job in terms of keeping the statistics and also recommending that people who are, who are serving not so serious offenses that their sentences be commuted, you know, through a process of remission. And then there's a separate process for long-term offenders okay. who are on death row, probably also life, lifers, they call lifers, that through the power of mercy committee, that their sentence may also be commuted to a life sentence and probably some, or some also to be released. They have done a great job in terms of rehabilitation. Actually, these statistics, even if you don't get it from the judiciary, yeah. we could get it from prison. So they have them live, you know, every day. They do an update in the evening, in the, every morning, midday, and in the evening, how many people we have on death row, how many people we have on life sentence, how many people are serving long sentences generally, how many people are on remand. I think when I checked the statistics last, 
prison population was at about 56,000. Mm -hmm. So it keeps on managing, keep on managing between 56, 54 to 56,000. Part of the reason why the, the number has gone up, people were convicted yeah. of murder, could be that the justice system is becoming more efficient and therefore cases are being finalized. Mm -hmm. It could be that crime has actually gone up. You know, it could also be that um, this, some of these people were not properly represented. So, they, they, I mean, it's difficult to put a finger, yes. put one on one particular issue, because mm -hmm. there's so many sectoral players, yeah. and we, mm -hmm. including the lawyers, yeah? You, we saw recently um, the lawyers in uh, Paul, in Paul McKenzie, is it called Paul McKenzie's yeah. case, yeah? Okay. You, know, you know, quitting the case, saying they're not receiving the support. And if you have lawyers who are demoralized, in an impartial judicial system like this one, where the courts have very limited role in terms of intervening to make sure that there's justice, you could have someone who otherwise would not have been convicted, getting convicted of murder and being sentenced just because they didn't have effective contact with a, with a lawyer mm -hmm. or they didn't get good representation from a lawyer. Because what the law says is that, yeah, if you are charged with murder, you are entitled to yeah. an advocate. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the actual access to a lawyer the quality of representation. So if you don't, there are so many, if, if you don't peel that layer and find out whether there was really quality representation, someone could get convicted. If the prosecution probably um, didn't do a good job, somebody who should be convicted will not get convicted, and so on and so forth. I think mm -hmm. this is a very important conversation that I make an appeal to all justice actors, all actors in the criminal justice system, to find a way of coordinating and synchronizing their actions and their interventions so that we can have a clearer picture on where we are on commission, on where we are as a country, yeah. on commission of serious offenses, for instance, murder. What are the triggers? What are we doing to mitigate them? Those who are getting in the criminal justice system, what are, what, 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 what are, the, what are, what are the factual issues coming out, the evidence that is coming out? Are they first time offenders? Are they repeat offenders? And so on and so forth. Those who have been sentenced, to death, and then were later commuted to life, and then somehow released. Are they back? You know what we call recidivism. Yeah. Are they back and committing new offences, and so on and so forth? I think then that we can use that to tailor make solutions, which can which can help us as a country mm -hmm. lessen the burden that presently bedevils the criminal justice system. And uh, Wesley, coming to you, because I'm looking at uh, about 600 inmates who are on a death row at the moment, according to a commission by the Death Penalty Project, and uh, as a justice, a legal officer, the justice uh, uh, defenders, normally there is uh, this uh, monitoring done by the Kenya Prison Service as to the rehabilitation process of anyone who is serving a sentence, um, depending on the degree, uh, and of course reintegration back into the society. The challenge here is then that, uh, Wesley, what are the mechanisms in place, or how do you then monitor? What are the mitigation measures for someone not to commit similar crime that he had committed, which probably might have led him uh, to be sentenced by a court of law after assessing the evidence before the courts? I think the first point of call should be legal awareness, informing the people that if you commit certain offenses, they attract certain punishments. I think that's the first thing we need to look at. And once we have been able to answer that question and informing the masses that if you commit certain offenses, there are certain repercussions, then we'll be able to have started to resolving the problem of people ending up on death row and in the long run ending up within our correctional facilities. Mm -hmm. And by the larger conversation that we're having, having on whether we, there is need to still maintain the death penalty, I believe I am one of the people who advocate that it has since passed its time because if you look at the various offenses out there, if you look at the Rome Statute and the various international crimes we have, uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, acts of aggression, neither of them attract the death penalty. Yes, you find someone murdered a mass number of people, mm -hmm. yet they still don't get to and get the highest penalty, which is death. And uh, this aspect of whereby you punish a person who has committed murder with death does not create a sense of 
uh, equality or justice. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at other offenses, like for instance, defilement, if I was given an example, someone who's convicted of defilement, they don't get the same punishment yeah. for what they've done. Someone, an arsonist, you don't, get, you don't touch their house because they have burned someone else's house. So I don't understand why we put murder in this special pedestal to get a equivalent sentence or punishment to the offense committed. Mm -hmm. Because it does not create a sense of stopping the offense from continuing. Because the statistics from the death penalty report shows that it has not even lessened the, the, the commission of this offense. As a matter of fact, it has increased. Because people are, one, for, for instance, not aware that if you commit, if you kill someone, you are likely to be equally killed, sentenced to death. And I think it is important for us now to start it from that point, that we inform the public that, yes, this is a wrong, and because of that wrong, you are likely to incur this particular mm -hmm. uh, offense. And once we are able to have that conversation, we can now start to move towards the abolition of this sentence okay. in totality from our laws. Thank you. Oh, well, well, I'll need to sample the feedback when uh, we do so. Uh, Demas, Demas uh, Wakili, Steve, and uh, Wesley, I'll take your final remarks here on the broadcast. And here's what you are, say what you are saying, the hashtag on Twitter is daybreak the sms code is double two four double two at citizen tv kenya and at ayub abdikadir and at safin underscore aching kipto ruta says how do we balance justice rehabilitation and human rights solving the intricate challenge requires reevaluating our approach to punishment the judiciary should strive for a system that prioritizes reform redemption and second chances Sir Nixon de Gure says, it seems like our laws are ambiguous. How come each law is interpreted differently by the law gurus? For instance, why should the life sentence be a puzzle? Next is Engineer Lazaro, who says, abolishing death sentence might encourage mob justice. Someone <coughs> who defiled a small child can be rehabilitated <coughs> back to the society as a watch, he says, as the society watches. Remy Butia says, a world in which we do not give up on people who have done terrible things and aim to facilitate their journey to a different place is a better world than the alternative. Next up is Godi Barasaware. He says our criminal justice system should be re-examined. We have seen individuals who should have been given a strong sentence. A strong sentence says walk away with the, the featherweight penalties while innocent ones facing heavy and punitive penalties. Those are your samples. <coughs> Demias, Demas, your final remarks here on the broadcast. Um, clearly, we have the statistics. Clearly, we have the reports from the National Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we have very good work that has been done by the AG's office and the National Council on Administration of Justice. So how come this does not translate into legislation? So I'd like to challenge Parliament to, to embrace this idea of uh, restorative justice mm -hmm. Uh, so that uh, we can have a country that lives up to the document okay. that uh, gives us all the mandate uh, to do. And just to, to end with uh, one uh, quote by Justice Krishna, it says that if every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. And it's the role of the law to remind us all of this. Thank you. See yeah. I think you, uh, I, we must continue to celebrate the progress we've seen in the criminal justice system and one of those progress uh, is that now in relation to the death penalty for arising from offenses from murder the offense of murder it is now a maximum not a mandatory sentence okay uh, we are waiting we are hoping to claim more ground in respect of the other three offenses that also attract the death penalty that is robbery with violence mm -hmm treason, espionage. I hope we will get to a level where these three of categories of offenses also benefit from the reading in Muratetu, so that even those offenses are seen as, the sentences there are seen as maximum and not mandatory. Okay. At the moment, if you're convicted of robbery with violence, the trial magistrate does not have the discretion. They'll sentence you to death. We are hoping that that discretion, which people who have been charged with the offense of murder mm -hmm. enjoy, will also be applied to others. Again, and lastly, other sentences that have mandatory, other offenses that have mandatory sentences generally, like sexual offenses. We are also hoping that in the future, we'll get to a place where any, any offense in our statute laws, in our laws, 
that have a mandatory sentence will be read to mean maximum and not mandatory. But so far, I think we are on the right track. Okay, thank you. Yes, we're thinking. I think uh, I would like to echo the words of the late uh, Ruth Gada Gunsberg, the Supreme Court Chief Justice of the US. I think she noted that a court ought not to be moved by the weather of the day, but by the climate of the season. And I think we are that era where our judiciary is not being moved by the weather of the day, but by the climate of the season, because we are realizing that we have faulted uh, our incarcerated person by committing them to the maximum sentences, tormenting them by being on death row. And it's a good thing that we are now moving towards the realization of decriminalizing this death, death penalty. And as uh, Mr. Gola has stated, I think it's important for us to equally reflect the same uh, benefit to those who have also been charged with robbery with violence and other offenses that dictate the death penalty. And as an organization, we are at the forefront because we have challenged the uh, section 296.2 of the penal code that provides for the death penalty as a sentence for those who have conv convicted with robbery violence. Okay. Equally, we are in court challenging the section 8.2 of the, uh, of the Sexual Offenses Act, which creates those mandatory sentences. Thank you. And we hope that the courts will reflect the same in the Morate to okay. these other various decisions and cases. Thank you, gentlemen. Your time is all appreciated. Wesley Waku is a legal officer at the Justice Defenders. Your time is all appreciated. Demas Kiprono is a campaign manager with Amnesty International. Thank you. And uh, Steve uh, Ogola is... Uh, an advocate of the High Court, your time is all appreciated. Gentlemen, we are keeping an eye on the situation following the call for anti-government protests by the opposition. Set to start today and uh, to lapse on Friday, a three-day demo that the opposition says is set to compel the government to address the high cost of living in the country. But the government maintains that Kenyans should go about their businesses and it will provide security. That is the word from the Interior National Administration Cabinet Secretary, Professor Kithure Kindiki. This has uh, calls for reconciliation and dialogue mount from stakeholders, including foreign envoys who are concerned about the political stability in the country. Yesterday, religious leaders have also called upon the president and the opposition leader to shelve their differences and dialogue to talk about the country's stability. Police, according to the papers, are expected to rein in on the demonstrators a week after more than 10 people were killed in the demos and their property distracted and concerns were raised over the police's handling of the demonstrators and the demonstrators also blamed for the destruction of property and key infrastructures and inst installations including the Nairobi Expressway. We'll be keeping you updated and assessments will be coming from the Kamukunji and the Jakaranda grounds that the opposition yesterday said that their supporters should be meeting or will be their meeting point and we're having our people on ground and shortly I'll be heading there of course as the opposition maintains that uh, the demos will be on. The government yesterday said all primary and secondary schools in Nairobi and Mombasa should be shut following that order from the Ministry of Interior and this as the Azimio Laomoja One Kenya coalition today begins what it calls a three-day protest to pressure the government to address some of the issues it had outlined. This is Daybreak. Up next is Health and Lifestyle with Safina Chengauma and thanks for watching. Good morning.